The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. My name is Haley Cassidy, and I'm AmeriChem's Global Branding and Digital Marketing Leader. I'd like to thank you all for joining today's presentation, Color Science, Controlling Color, which is where we will be talking about the overriding challenge in controlling color, which is how to convey accurate measurement correlation at different steps in the supply chain. All attendees are muted, so please send in your questions through the questions tab, and we will address them at the end of the presentation during our Q&A segment. Today, we will start with a brief introduction of our panelists and who Americam is, followed by discussing the challenge of finding a measurement system that accurately and repeatedly predicts visual perception. Rejecting good material or approving bad material can cause lost time, add color correction costs, and work away at total budget costs. This webinar teaches you how to control your color and come out with the right material. At the end of the webinar, we'll take your questions that you send in during the presentation. Today, I am joined by Ron Beck, AmeriChem's R&D manager. Ron has over 44 years of experience in the industry with a specific focus in research and development. He holds a bachelor's degree in natural science from the University of Akron and also has achieved his Six Sigma black belt. You can connect with Ron via his email that you see here or on LinkedIn. And just to give you a brief overview of who AmeriChem is, we are a global master batch and compound manufacturer that supplies our products to a wide variety of industries. We have 11 locations worldwide, including our newest acquisition in Denmark that will be enhancing our AmeriChem engineered compounds division. So with over 79 years of experience and over 900 employees worldwide, AmeriChem is your global partner in manufacturing polymeric solutions. I will now turn it over to Ron for the rest of the presentation on controlling color. Thanks, Sally. Haley, uh, really I'm glad to be here. I um, hope everyone is having a good day and can gain some knowledge out of this presentation. So let's get started on controlling color. So to we'll start off with that, I, I love this picture painted by MC Escher called Relativity because it it demonstrates how different observers can view something and see it in different ways. Controlling color is about gaining the correct perspective on, on color. So a fourth principle in lean methodology is the removal of waste within the flux of the supply chain. And in any business, one of the heaviest drains on profitability is waste. Uh, lean waste can come from in the form of time, material, and labor. In lean manufacturing waste is any expense or effort expended that does not, which, but which does not transform raw materials into an item that your customer is willing to pay for. By optimizing color process steps and eliminating waste, only the true value is added to each step of supply chain phases. The challenge is to find a measurement system that accurately and repeatedly predicts visual perception. Rejecting good material and approving bad material can cause lost time, add color correction costs, and affect your brand credibility. This webinar teaches you how to control your color and come out with the right material with lower waste. So controlling color is a process. This process consists of six steps. The first step is that, that the tolerance must be determined. The next step is the, the, the measurement device must be calibrated and verified. Then the measurement system precision must be evaluated and proved if it is greater than 10% of the tolerance. Next, and probably the most important step, is to clarify the color target. Finally, the vendor and the customer correlation must be determined. 
When we assess color, it's to understand whether the material we are assessing is in or out of specification. Our assessment has four possible outcomes. We can use a truth, truth table to describe these scenarios. Two of the four outcomes are based on visual assessment with outcomes of approval or rejection. We will also consider the visual assessment as reality. The other two outcomes can be approved or rejected also, but from an inter instrumental perspective. So if we visually assess the standard in a batch pair, and we approve the batch as in specification, and then we measure the color differences and determine that the batch is in specification, we have that made the correct decision. Likewise, if we visually assess the standard in a batch pair and reject the batch as out of specification, and measurement of the, the batch's color differences and deem it out of specification, we have also made the correct decision. On the other hand, if we measure the and reject the material but visually accept it, we have made a false negative error. This means we will be color correcting material that is visually acceptable. Even worse, if we measure and approve the material, but it is visually unacceptable, we have made a false positive error and we will ship bad material. Correcting material visually in specification cause shipping delays as costs the delays in has cost, but shipping out of specification can affect the brand credibility. It would seem intuitive that determining that your tolerance would should be the last step of controlling color because it's part of the uh, end of the assessment process. Natural progression after you get your correlation and you wouldn't want to uh, know which you're in control. Knowing the required tolerance will aid you in understanding the measurement precision required. There are some general guidelines for a meaningful tolerance that I would recommend. Um, large parts that touch, such as vinyl siding, automotive interior panels, and carpet have the tightest tolerances, and I would recommend, uh, say, a 0.5 CMCV. Smaller parts that don't touch, such as bottles, buttons, and accents, can have wider tolerances, uh, say 1.0 CMCV. Then color indicators have the widest tolerances of 2.0 CMCV. You, you just want to make sure that you don't confuse your orange wire with your, your red wire. So meaningful instrumental tolerances must correlate to a visual assessment because computers don't buy products equally. Unnecessary color control costs will be occurred accrued if your tolerances are too tight. If your tolerances are too loose, then you will be in noticed as poor quality by your, your customers. Ensure that you have a good color specification it is good practice to visually assess your standard batch pair and decide whether you think that it passes or fails. Next, you would measure the color differences instrumentally to determine whether it passes or fails instrumentally. Next, you visually make another visual assessment to ensure that your instrumental measurement even makes sense. So you're trying to really qualify all this to make sure that what you're measuring actually makes sense to what you're what you get, see visually. One way to set up a, a, a good way to determine a color tolerance is to review your historical assessments. This process also helps to validate an existing tolerance. 
the first step is to collect more than 30 visually good and bad standard and batch pairs. One problem with using historical assessments is there are normally very few failing or difference pairs. It's best if there is close to an equal number of good and bad color difference pairs. And so you can uh, do a better assessment on your tolerance border. Typically, an assess assessor may have 28 good color pairs, let's say, and, and only two bad pairs. As a workaround, America offers a service to existing customers by creating a collection of good and bad color difference pairs for evaluation. Next, the, the 30 color difference pairs are evaluated by qualified assessor visually under control lighting conditions. Finally, the assessments are collected and evaluated, and PMC DE can be predicted from the assessor's evaluation of the different color pairs. Typically, this process can be done on one color to represent a color space and CMC is used as the specification. In many cases, uh, a customer will want to do multiple uh, color spaces to, to ensure that it is, in fact, the same throughout the space, but in general, it ends up being uh, the same predicted specification. The next step in your color control process is to calibrate and ver verify your measurement after determining your tolerance. This process needs to be done for visual and instrumental assessments. It's important to, to view the assessment, measure the differences to the standard, and then view the assessment again to determine if the measurement differences make sense. To verify that the assessor's eyes for a visual assessment, we recommend that you take the one cell 100 key color vision test. The test aims to order the shown color discs in the correct order. Any misplacements can point to a normal observer's color vision deficiencies. A normal color, a normal observer consists of a young, younger and older people, men and women, and people in the, in the color industry and people that are not in the color industry. It's not about trying to see how finely you can see. We're just testing to see if you have normal color vision. I recommend that all the colorists are tested for a normal color vision or normal color vision using the X-ray one cell 100 Q color vision test. Listed on the slide is a website that offers on, an online version of the test, but I would caution you to use a calibrated monitor before taking the online test. You may find that you do not do well on it, but it could be just that you're not seeing the test properly without a calibrated monitor. It is essential to control your, your visual assessment environment also. I recommend using the Automotive Standard SAE Day 361, which is the procedure for visual evaluation of interior and exterior automotive trim. It is an excellent pr procedure to control for tra traditional values such as light source, spectral energy distribution, appropriate light source distance, viewing angle, and best color surround. The color surround should be a neutral gray, which is specified in the in the venue. So, when I ask what the color is neutral gray, a person explained to me that if you look at a photograph of the entire world in black and white and then you mix it together, you get this neutral gray. I'm not quite sure how they would come up with that, but it struck me as kind of funny. Now we're going to move to instrument calibration and verification. The instrument calibration and verification must be performed to ensure acceptable instrument precision and accuracy. Most colors calibrate their instrument by setting the spectrophotometer's light and dark range. This is done with a supplied white tile and black trap. Calibration is always done because the color software will not 
that you take a measurement with respect to the pedometer and data calibration, which is good. Verification, on the other hand, is not enforced. Uh, Spectra pedometer verification is done by measuring a set of certified colored tiles with known reflectance measurements. These measurements are compared to the measure to your measurements of your spectrophotometer. Verification of your spectrophotometer can help reduce the cost to do the measurement drift, should identify its instruments in need of service, and helps to avoid inaccurate color in production of products. It is vital to take care of your and maintain your spectrophotometer properly. I've seen a spectrophotometer replaced directly in a manufacturing area so that the, the operator can te test for color very quickly. Typically, the manufacturing environment is hot and dusty, which is not suitable for a spectrophotometer. Spectrophotometer needs to be placed in a clean environment at ambient temperature or room temperature. It would be best to calibrate your spectrophotometer according to the OEM specifications as mentioned earlier. Typically, a drip test should be done daily to ensure spectrophotometers be behaving normally. It is customary to use a green tile to measure and apply statistical process control analytics to show the measurement is in, in fact in process control. The measurement is typically performed daily because if there is an out of signal, out of control signal, your, your measurement since the last measurement is, is suspect, which means you would have to go back and remeasure every, everything that was out of since the, the last time your instrument was in control. If you did it, say, weekly, then you would have to uh, check a week's worth of, of uh, measurements. Or it would be best if you ran profile or perform round robin testing to, to, to ensure that the, the instrument is behaving properly. Lastly, there should be a routine maintenance performed on the spectrophotometer by a trained and certified technical technician annually. We recommend using your the original equipment manufacturer to do this. The service is a bit expensive, but you may, if you make thousands of color decisions, it's well worth the money, in my opinion. Next in the color control process is to evaluate your measurement accuracy and precision. I will use arrows hitting a target to understand the differences between Accuracy and precision, which maybe many people have already seen, but I'll go over it for those that haven't. The target shown on the left shows low accuracy because none of the arrows are in the target center and the arrows are not tightly packed, so there's low precision. The next target has high accuracy because all the arrows are centered around the target's center, but the arrows are not tightly packed, so there is still low precision. The next target does have high precision with tightly packed arrows, but the arrows are low and to the left, showing low accuracy. Finally, the last target has tightly packed arrows at the center with high precision and, and accuracy. So to, to evaluate your color measurement process precision, because we want to try to get this precision to be 10% of the specification, you must perform a gauge r and to understand your variation as it relates to your operators, your spectrometer, and your parts. A common mistake is that, is that the parts used for the gauge r and r are different colors, therefore there's a high variation in the parts. The variation in the parts is due to the parts being of different colors. So you would want to select parts from a single run to understand your part-to-part -part variation. 
The gauge R&R's goal is to determine the total variation to see if it's less than 10% of your specification, so a minimal amount of your tolerance is used by the color measurement of the process variation. Once you run your gauge R&R, you determine that you have greater than 10% variation in your color measurement process. To reduce the variation in your color measurement process, you can use the ASDM standard practice to reduce the effect of variability of a color measurement by using multiple measurements. This process of reducing variation of your color measurements is accomplished by sampling 10 parts from your production run or your testing run for that matter. If you run a pre-check to validate your color quality before you run parts in your manufacturing process, you will need to create 10 color checkout samples. The first step is to measure one part 10 times. We have a spreadsheet that we use to enter the 10 measurements into, which makes it simpler. The next step is to add your desired precision. For example, let's say uh, you have a tolerance of 0.05, or excuse me, 0.5. Therefore, your desired precision needs to be 10% of the tolerance or 0.05. You then calculate the number of measurements that are needed to be averaged together to give you a color measurement precision of 0.05, according to the, the calculations in the ASTM E1345 procedure. The result of the number of measurements to be averaged required, let's say, an, an example is three. The next step is to measure all 10 parts, measuring each part three times and averaging obtain the number of sample parts required to get the precision of less than 10% of the tolerance again. The result, let's say the result this time is two, this means you will need to sample two parts and measure each part three times and average all those measurements together to obtain a measurement precision of less than 10%. So let's say on, on the, upon the completion of the ASTM J1345 procedure, you determine your number of measurements that you need to be averaged on a single part is 25, and the number of parts that you need to be measured is 75, which is, is 1,875 total measurements that need to be measured to obtain a precision of less than 10%. This would be entirely too much work to do. So since you cannot reduce your variation through replication, it would be necessary to optimize your measurement process by performing a root cause analysis. Root cause analysis is intended to reveal key relationships among various variables. The possible cause provided additional insight into the process behavior. A common root cause analysis tool is, uh, is called uh, the Ishikawa diagram, or probably more commonly called the fishbone diagram. The, the five bends is one of the most common frameworks for root cause analysis, which is the man, machine, material, method, and measurement. An example of an outcome could be that your operators do not follow the color measurement procedure properly and they need to be retrained. Once the change has been made to the color measurement process, then the gauge R and R must be repeated to ensure the precision is less than 10% of the tolerance. And then if it's if it's not, but it's much better, you can then rerun the replication experiment to see if you can then get it further down by replication. If you then have your replication and so getting there, then that replication needs to be put into your procedure. And the, and, the, and the operators will need to be retrained. One of the biggest confusions between a vendor and a customer is what is the standard? American is 
is excellent at color manipulation as long as we know what the color target is. This is why it's so important to clarify the standards. The automotive industry has come up with a way to manage standards. Uh, the first standard is called the official standard. And it's the physical standard representing the color concept, usually when it's first matched. Or if feasible, the official standard should have the same composition and construction as, as the final part. But in most cases, it is, it is not. It's like a pantone or something like that. It shows it in this, in this slide. Next, there is a reference standard, which is a physical standard used to calibrate working standards. Reference standards should be of the same composition as, as uh, the working standards, which we're going to talk about later. The reference standards are instrumentally referenced to the official standard. Then there are the working standards. They are physical standards that are used routinely in day-to-day -day work. Working standards must be made of the same material and construction, identical to the reference standard. They need to be instrumentally referenced to the official standards since, since the working standards are, are used routinely, they may become soiled and will need to be replaced from time to time. So that's why it's nice to know instrumentally where they are in relationship to the reference standard. Communication of standard descriptors is essential to good color communication, especially with instrumental measurements. Standard measurements should include what color equation would be used for the measurements, such as uh, Star Lab, DECMC 2000, etc. Uh, what are the required primary illuminants, such as D65A or F2? Which standard observer was used? American prefers that a 10 degree observer is used. I have another presentation that goes into why that would be. What spectrophotometer geometry was, was used? American prefers that the sphere geometry spectrophotometer is used for color control. What specular set? What was the specular set to in the measurement if the sphere geometry was used? The American here for Thursday, you use specular included for color, not specular excluded. Um, usually when people use specular excluded, they're trying to get appearance attributes into the, the measurement. And it's better to use specular included for color and then control your gloss with a Kind of as a side note, don't assume that your Pantone swatch matches exactly in two different books. Pantone swatches can only be used for color concepts and not for color control. I'm a big vinyl record collector, and when handling a, a record, you always hold the hit by the edges to ensure that you do not get any dirt or oil on the face of the record or you will hear the contamination when you play it you should never touch the record's face always hold it by the edges that is how you should handle your standards if you're if you cannot handle your standards by the edges you should you need to use clean lint-free gloves you should also ensure that your lint-free gloves do not contain any optical brightness Closed detergent often contains optical brightness, so keep that in mind if you wash your gloves. Standard should always be stored in a cool, dark, dry place in an acid cream paper sleeve, kind of like the, the, the vinyl record is, should be. Standards that are made out of phenolic stabilized olefins can turn yellow or pink or dark gas from a lift truck. The final step in controlling color is to determine the correlation between the vendor and the customer. Determining 
correlation is quite complex and I will only present the major steps at a high level. I have a, a, a more detailed presentation that goes into more specifically how this is done. The first step is to clarify the color measurement parameters as discussed before. Then the target is determined and any offsets to the target are applied. Next, the biases or shifts need to be determined for spectral photometer differences, process shifts, et cetera, between the vendor and the customer. After determining the biases, the, the tolerance needs to be agreed on upon by the vendor and the customer. Finally, the vendor and the customer need to modify their tolerances to accommodate for their own or different measurement variability. The challenge in controlling color is to find a measurement system that accurately and repeatedly predicts visual perception. It can eliminate any unnecessary cost by clarifying the color target, reducing measurement variation, and having inappropriate tolerances. It's important to remember that rejecting good material or approving bad material can cause lost time, add color correction costs, and affect your brain credibility. So that concludes my presentation on color control set for the review of the, the concepts presented. Controlling color is a process that starts with determining the tolerance. Next, you need to ensure your instrument is, are calibrated and verified. Then the measurement precision needs to be evaluated for, for the customer, the color matcher, the color quality testing technician, et cetera. After, after the measurement precision is quantified and then the precision is found to be greater than 10% of the tolerance, then the precision needs to be improved. Next, the standard target needs to be clarified and offset set. Lastly, the correlation needs to be determined and any bias is set. It's vital to, finally, it is vital to track your and communicate your color results lot to lot between the vendor and the customer to ensure everyone is on the same page. And that's all I have. Thank you, Ron. Uh, that was a great presentation. We'll now move on to the Q&A portion of our webinar. I'll be reading off the questions that have been submitted and pass them on to our panelists for answering. Our first question is, how do you ensure vendors and customers are using the same process to ensure they are in tolerance and how do you reconcile the differences? That's a good question. Um, both parties do not need to have the same process to ensure they are in tolerance. Um, it's important to understand that clearly what is the color target and what the color measurement offsets and shifts are. Um, to reconcile the differences, it's essential to have a vendor and customer each measure a, the same part to gain an understanding of their color measurement differences in their process. Okay, our next question is, how do you convince your customers to move to a more modern color difference equation such as CMC? Uh, the reason it's difficult to move organizations to a more modern color difference equation like CMC is that they have so much historical data. You know, all the color software packages uh, have the ability to show multiple color difference equations. So I, I recommend viewing CMC to see how it corresponds with a more traditional color difference equation so that you can look at both of them at the same time. And the traditional color difference equation is in specification, let's say, but CMC shows the color differences are out of specification, then you need to look at the color differences visually and see if the color differences need to make sense. Likewise, if, if the 
traditional polar difference equation shows that the batch is out of specification, and CMC shows the product is in specification, then look at the color differences again visually and, and make a decision. Eventually, your, the, the customer will have more historical data on CMC and it'll start to show that CMC is traditionally going to be correct more often. Okay, our next question is, color communication to others when they use a different color system can be a major challenge. How do you communicate certain lab measurements to a Pantone reference? Could you repeat the question again? Yes, color communications to others when they use a different color system can be a challenge. How do you communicate lab measurements to a Pantone reference? But the only the only way you can really get in, inspect or have, have you know measurements that, that are meaningful is both parties have to measure the same part. So if that's a Pantone. Um, the thing to keep in mind though is a Pantone is usually just a, a designer's you know, concept. So having it exact usually doesn't matter at that point so i don't know if that answers the question or not. okay our next question is what do you mean by drift test and round robin test uh the drift test is where you would measure a a, a pile every day to see if you're in, in statistical process control to see if, if, if the instrument is in control or another way to look at it is, is drifting. Traditionally that is done with the, uh, the green tile and the, in the uh, profiling set of tiles that I spoke about earlier and then you would just measure that green tile every day and apply statistical block process control to it and to, to make sure that you know you're getting kind of a random measurement of the green tile and not have some sort of trend or drift if you will. The round robin um, is where you would go with a service that sends out a set of three usually color swatches to measure and everybody's kind of measuring the same swatches uh, and so you get a better idea how you your spectrophotometer is measuring amongst the industry you can also you know link to your customers so you can see where their spectro lies in relationship to your spectro you can also connect it to all your all of the spectros in your corporation so you can see where you lie the one, the one downfall of the round robin is that you only get like a specific set of colors that are fairly close together. So you may get like a, a neutral blue, but it's just a blue that's very slightly. Um, where in the profiling, you're 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 measuring known known uh, uh, ceramic tiles, and then you're you're kind of covering your whole space. The point of the whole thing is to detect any kind of performance issues with your spectro so that you can get it serviced to, 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 to get back on track. In many cases, it's not as, you know, it's nothing more complicated than you have to vacuum out your, your sphere or something like that. Okay, our next question is. What do you prefer for measurements for color evaluation? Well, if that means what equation do, do, should you use, um, I would use CMC 2000. Um, I would use the most modern because you know, even though I say the word modern, it's still CMC 2000 means it was created in 
the year 2000, which means it's still 20 years old. But the, the one, and I, and, I, and, I, and I have a more in-depth presentation that I, I can give to a customer of ours where I discuss just the credibility of these equations in the first place. Um, the CMC 2000 still is not perfect for what the visual assessment is. It's the best we have, but it's still not perfect. I think it's something that is. 80% reliable. That's why we insist that people look at stuff to see if they make sense. So uh, my answer is that I would use the most modern one possible. Okay, our next color is four effect colors. If you do not have a multi-angle equipment, could you suggest another way of reading the color? Can you repeat that? I didn't quite get the first part of that. Yes. For effect colors, if we do not have a multi-angle equipment, could you suggest another way of reading the color? Um, Uh, not really. Um, you really, to, since, since, since you could measure a, a special effect color with a, with a, just a sphere spectral photometer, you could get repeatable results from it, but then when you change the angle, you may not use say you know looking at it on the face it, it matches but then when you when you do what's called a flop then you think it's a mismatch so I don't know any way that you could do that. I mean you would have to change the angle of the of the you, you almost have to make at least two measurements. You, have to, you would have to look at it at two angles to be able to make sure that the, the, the face and the flop are in spec. And I, I don't know how you would do that without using a multi-angle. Um, those multi-angle spectrophotometers have come down in price quite a lot, so I don't know if that helps any. Okay, our next question is, how do you deal with different gloss between customer and supplier? Well, like I kind of described earlier, the, the critical thing is when you, and we have other color webinars that we do where it's like, that describe all this, but the, the, the bottom line is, well, let me use an example. So let's say I make a, a, a molded plaque and it's got different losses on it. A single master batch put into that or a compound made from a colored compound, the different glosses will look different colors, which means it's, it has a different appearance. But in reality, it's used the same color package. And that's why I said earlier, it's important that when it comes to gloss, color differences due to gloss, you need to control your gloss with a gloss meter and make sure that your glosses are in fact right. And then you measure the specular inquiry with a, with a a sphere geometry spectrophotometer for your color measurement part. And then if those two are good, it should look good coloristically by its appearance. Okay, and this is our final question. Um, how do you go about determining if a color sample is metametric? Well, there's kind of 
two ways to do that. Um, the one way is when you measure it, if they're metameric, they are they are spectrally different. So reflectance curve is in fact different. And there's kind of a general rule that says if it if the two the two curves cross each other three times or more, then it's metameric. Um, another way is to is to look at the color differences under different light sources. So you could uh, traditional one to get the, the amplification of the metamera is, is to is to uh, use uh, different luminance and using an A illuminate really is a way to really amplify the difference of scene. Um, and for those that don't even know what the camera is in this, the camera is in this, this is not how we define it, but it's the easiest way to understand it. It means it matches under one light, and then it is a mismatch under another light source. So if you look at it in, say, out in the in daylight versus under like a fluorescent light, and it looks different under each one than it's not there. One thing to keep in mind about the camera is, is you know, it could be metameric by definition, but it'd be so small that it makes you don't notice it. So, you, once again, you've got to look at stuff to see is this objectionable or different to the light sources. So, you can use the control light to, to, to look at these different light sources. Okay, that wraps up our Q and A. Yeah, one more. Thing. The, the one thing to keep in mind too is, does it does it matter that America? Once I said before, when you're controlling color, you know, you you, you want to make sure that it's that it's made of the same materials and construction, the so same gloss, same same uh, uh, you know uh, polymer it's put into, same colorants are used. Because if you measured a, a Pantone versus a plastic part, I would guarantee it's going to be metameric because you're comparing inks to pigments and it's just going to be different. Um, but that's why I'm saying you use Pantone as a concept. And then you're just, once you finally lock down what you think the matches in your, your you know, primary light, say, it might be, you know, daylight for an automotive interior, and it might be fluorescent for a, for a bottle. And then, then you, once you say it's matched, now you control your color to that one and keeping everything the same, and so it should not be metaphoric. Right. Okay, that wraps up our Q&A portion of the webinar. I'd like to thank our panelist for his time today, and I'd like to thank our attendees for joining America in this important discussion about controlling color. I'd also like to mention briefly here how you can ask us further questions after the webinar is over. If you have any other questions, you can certainly connect with our panelist on LinkedIn, but you can also go to the American website and ask us questions through the instructions on this slide. If you go to the website link displayed on this slide, which is simply our American homepage, you can go to our contact us page and choose the form that states I have a general corporate inquiry and then choose the option to send the contact form to marketing. I will receive all of these questions directly and follow up as soon as possible with our panelists. You can take a screenshot of these directions, but we will also be sending out a follow-up email with the directions in the email and a link to the contact page. Thank you again for attending our webinar today, and that concludes our presentation. Thanks, everyone.